So we have 37 minutes left. I want to make sure that we have some time for people sitting in the room to be able to raise questions. So what I'd like to do now, if it's possible, is really to ask each of you a question which I'd like, if it's possible, to answer it very quickly in two minutes, if you could. And I, the first question I have is for you, uh, Madame Touré, which is, you heard this vision of you know, multiple frameworks and, and coexisting. In some ways, you have some of that already. From your point of view, would that be a good outcome or would that be a bad outcome? Well, definitely, uh, I've spent now some years in the multilateral organization. I was a former UN personnel for many years, went back to, I mean, went to government. And I came out of this process uh, thinking that you need frameworks, for sure. You need many frameworks. Um, and I always speak from the the point of view of Africa now, I mean, after having been global, now focusing on Africa, um, the richest continent, by the way, by any means, and the poorest. Um, so whatever framework that will deal with that issue, we're going to be part of it first. Um, second, um, I'm more interested, and in, I think that's the feeling in the continent, that we have to take uh, business into our own hands. Um, how to strengthen African Union, how to make sure that we are self-interest driven because that's how the world works and we are going to be more uh, forward coming in terms of um, you know, defending our interest, um, being very strong on you know, whatever issues and making our own points. Um, I appreciate it when you uh, talk about you know, sort of forcing some countries to, to take part. That was the case for the Russia, Ukraine war, and you know most of African countries look at it as a white man's war, <laughs> somehow, and uh, just didn't take it, you know, position, and that's that's how rights, um, like everybody does. Um, but I think the questions that need to be um, uh, reflect upon is how are we going to make sure that we uh, move forward peacefully. Uh, peacefully to a more equal order, an order that respects the environment, that put women also on an equal footage. Nobody brought the issue of, 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 of inequalities and, and, and making sure that young people are part of it. Um, and that will need um, for the corporations. I think that's, that's okay. very important to bring uh, that upon. To look beyond profit, because we are a profit-driven um, world as we speak. So it's not enough anymore. So do we want to go through changes by revolution or do we want to be smarter and put in place, you know, equal, um, you know, frameworks where uh, true discussion comes out of, uh, of what, we, what we want to, uh, to build for the future. Every time I come in this country, in the Emirates, I remember that Dubai, a hundred years ago, was a small Bedouin village. So how did change occur? It means that it's possible. Uh, it means that you can accelerate change. It, and then you can uh, have a more sane discussion. Because we are having an insane discussion. Right. Uh, because you do have a poll of very wealthy uh, group of countries in front of, of very poor countries. But within those countries, you do also have that huge gap. I was visiting south of Senegal in the mining areas just before I came. I mean, it, it was terrible. You do have like very big mining companies, um, you know, taking gold out of the country. And they were not even capable of building a decent, um, you know, road <laughs> because they don't care about it. They just have an airport. They can fly a private jet. Go. There. It looks like the world we are in. Um, so how are we going to, 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 to take a pause? and then come back to what the United Nations was supposed to be as a promise, um, and share the common interest as human being. Other than that, I mean, people are, what I'm seeing now, uh, very much even into the, you know, within the intellectual elite, is let's focus on our own interests as the rest of the world is doing. Um, human rights, okay, we can talk about it very globally, but 
it's not a reality. Right. So that's how we, we, we look at it. So what are the solutions that we want to come up with um, that, is, that are human rights centered, that are equal, and preserve the environment beyond mm -hmm. just the idea of pursuing profit? Thank you very much. So very clear message that you want to be clear about your own interests and engage in multiple conversations, multiple frameworks, but be clear about what is the, to the benefit of the, the continent and organize yourselves in a way to better represent those interests. And in that context, I assume that you, know, you and many uh, leaders in Africa would welcome the decision about making the African Union part a permanent member of the G20, because I think that in some ways is one forum where that could happen. Um, you know, I want to turn to you and ask you a question. You know, you sort of said, you've heard this vision about the, your four different scenarios. To what extent is where you end up across those scenarios a function of the relationship between the US and China? How much is that going to drive where you end up? And what's your quick, quick response to that? Yeah, I guess the relation between US and China uh, probably is the, the one of the most important uh, relationship, um, which you will drive uh, uh, many things, including uh, uh, geopolitical tension. Uh, uh, although Euro, uh, European countries say to China, uh, don't lock us through US. When they visit US, US say, or they say to US government, don't lock us through China. But actually, the US-China relationship uh, now is kind of uh, pre uh, very important law. The good news is in past several months, we can see the tension between US and China a little bit reduced. May not big improvement, but the tension being reduced. I think that's good for US, for China, for the rest of the world. Uh, but at the same time, we should be sure, we should understand that the, the policy uh, U.S. government adopt to China call small yard hall fence wouldn't be changed. So competition wouldn't be changed, but the, 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 the tension has been reduced. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for being so clear about it. And of course, you have to see what is the mechanism by which the small yard stays small? <laughs> because the, the internal pressures in all countries will be to make the, the yard bigger <laughs> without worrying about the height of the fence. Uh, now, I, I want to turn to you I and mean, ask you a, a question, which is, let's assume there's some continuing improvement but in the US-China relationship, but still tension and, and particularly when it comes to setting up global rules, to what extent can middle powers create a set of rules that govern relationships among them, even if the largest economies in the world are not so actively participating? And I'm thinking of dispute resolution in the WTO, where the formal process is frozen, but there is a parallel process that has been created by middle powers, which works to, to basically govern disputes as if it was within the WTO, more or less. To what extent do you think that's a model that can be used in lots of different ways to, to govern, provide frameworks for, for the world? Um, thank you for your questions. In fact, uh, you, what you mentioned is ideal, but in reality, it cannot be applied. In fact, the US, European Union, and China, the only powers who make the regulations, without them, it's not possible. You see, the, I participated in the Uruguay Laon negotiation in the 80s, 90s. It was de facto bilateral negotiations between European community at the time and United States, despite 
more than 100 countries participated. But now, the landscape are totally changed, totally changed, especially with the joining of China to the WTO in 2001. So I think it's uh, very important to persuade the middle powers, the, the role, including Korea, Japan, if you say the European Union is a middle power, okay, the UK, Canada, and other countries to persuade both China and United States to participate in strengthening rule-based international order because the strengthening rule-based order is the only solution to their dispute. Without clear rules, they cannot make any settlement. So I think the middle powers must enhance their efforts to persuade China and U.S. respectively to honor the already established commitment and agree to the strengthening the rule-based order. Thank you very much. That, that's also very clear. So the middle power's role is not to create a framework that works for them, because from what you're saying, it doesn't work without getting the big China and U.S. into it. But they can play a major role in helping to persuade. And, I, and I, I think that's quite relevant for a conversation we'll have later about climate change. You know, we're going to be having COP here in, in a few weeks. And, and the, is that the approach one has to follow also in COP? Uh, and, and Pierre, I want to come to you with a question, which is you had a very long list of things that need to be fixed in the world order. And, we all have. <laughs> and, and everybody will add to it. You know, if we, if we go around the room, we'll add another 20 other things. And yet, Grant's point about mutual interest. So, which of these lists on your list, what is, would you say is the single point on which we cannot make progress without international cooperation? And it is in our mutual interest to create a framework for operating them. And then there are other things where it would be nice to have cooperation, but the world will struggle along without cooperation. So what's your sort of priority list of things? Well, there are many ways to, to address that question. First, I, I, I'd be tempted to say that uh, whatever I think doesn't matter, because what we need to do is reach a consensus. So for that to happen, we need to discuss with others. And I think the priority today is not to pick an issue and a solution. It is to meet and discuss and see where national interests are and how they can be combined to define a common good. But of course, as an analyst, I would attempt to answer differently and say there are major issues today that cannot be addressed without collective action. And certainly climate change is one. So it's, a, it, it's, it's going to be a mix of these two approaches. I think that we come to the negotiating tables with ideas, with convictions, but these convictions can reach nothing unless they are shared by others. So it's part of the negotiating process. And to negotiate, you need to understand and try to know more about the other parties. And that's why I think that more research, more knowledge is needed to understand our potential partners and allies better than we do, because we, we, we are working with stereotypes. And that is not going to, 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 make, uh, to, 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 to make the negotiation easier, easier. Now, there is a third way to address your question, which is to say that we cannot progress without a common vision. And, and I, I believe that's true. And I believe that part of the negotiation is to reach a common vision. The difficulty is that when you look at history, common mobilizing visions, shared visions, tend to come out during wars. So a big question today is whether I mean, it, it's what William J. James would have called in the early uh, uh, 20th century is the moral equivalent of war. Where is today the moral equivalent of war? Sustainable development goals? No. Climate change? Not even. The uh, net zero economics? Not mobilizing enough. So where is this project that can be mobilizing enough to create a shared vision? 
And I don't know, and that what I think makes me afraid, because if we need a major crisis of major proportions, much bigger than when we have experience, or a big war to reach that common vision, then I think that it is certainly not the preferred scenario. So I'll stop there, uh, because that, 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 that. it's not very optimistic, but mm -hmm. I, I believe that the pessimism of analysis can lead to the optimism of action, and I think that we need more multilateral discussions, and even when summits don't reach a conclusion, it doesn't mean that they are not useful or successful. Thank you very much, Pierre. So this is getting a little somber towards the end, but uh, let's have. So do, do, do you agree that we need common vision and understanding each other before we can actually reach the agreements on, on things that matter to us? And maybe quite hard to get to a common vision without more of a crisis. Um, or do you think that it's possible to isolate one or two areas where we really need, in our mutual interest, without a common vision about the world and where it's going, still make progress? So how, how do you see this, this big vision, big bargain versus let's pick a few things? Mm. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. But um, I would say that uh, listening to the discussion, uh, I reflected on the current situation in general, and I would say that, uh, to my mind, um, we now are in a situation when a lot of old and uh, fundamental processes are still evolving, and we don't see the end of these trends uh, close enough uh, to uh, realize whether we can uh, orchestrate a new order or not. So, first of all, uh, we have seen since the beginning of the 21st century uh, the intensification of uh, military conflicts uh, in many parts of the world. And in any case, uh, I would say no political goals were really met with uh, uh, armed interventions. Uh, the economic uh, effect was very devastating for many countries. Uh, and uh, this new you know, circle of war, like uh, the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, we also contribute to the understanding that the military interventions and the military confrontation is ruinous for the contemporary world and it just, uh, you know, um, destroys the economic wealth and doesn't, has, doesn't have any positive consequences because in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, wars, uh, they deliver economic benefits for the, victory, uh, for the victors. Now it is not the case. Uh, so, and before this would be uh, really understood, I think uh, there is no little chance for new order to exist. The second point is that uh, every time uh, the, uh, it was spoken about economic order and the new economic reality, uh, it was uh, when uh, the new economic trend emerged. For example, uh, in 1960s, 1970s, uh, the raw uh, resource production producing countries, they became, you know, very high flyer in economic uh, sense. Uh, and uh, the very concept of new international economic order was put forward in 1971. But 15 years later, all these countries were ruined by, you know, the huge debts, uh, and they were bailed out by the United States and many other de uh, developed countries. Uh, the same situation was, uh, as I already mentioned, with the Soviet Union and Japan in 70s and 80s. They were also high flyers, and then a uh, huge uh, systemic crisis emerged. So now we have this competition between China and the rest of the world, and I think we should wait for another, I would say, 10 years to understand what the perspective for China is. If China uh, comes to the same uh, result as uh, Japan in 1989, by the end of this decade, it would be an absolutely different perspective for new economic right. order to emerge. And the last point, which uh, the colleague said very interesting, was the problem of taxation and the problem of uh, you know, uh, offshore safe havens. So uh, in this case, I would say that uh, this uh, tax system, which exists uh, in, in the whole world these days, uh, actually takes its, uh, it has its roots, uh, it takes its roots from the early 20th century. And uh, all the tax system was uh, designed for either 
mercantilistic economy, economy of trade, or for industrial economy, where uh, you know everything was reproducible and whatsoever, and uh, the stock market, uh, the capital gains were not so much anticipated. Now, uh, the creative economy of post-industrial world of informational technologies creates a lot of wealth, and this wealth creation is actually a major engine for economic growth and prosperity. If uh, we tax uh, personal incomes or capital gains as we do for uh, last decades, uh, it would stop economic growth in the most promising countries. So my point would be, so for you know, challenging this uh, offshore economy, some countries, wealthy countries, should switch from the taxing the incomes to taxing the consumption. And this may change immediately and generally the whole economic construction, uh, the whole economic uh, framework for the, for the world, because the first country that changes the system, uh, it will get enormous competitive advantages uh, upon all others. So I would say there are too many trends which are coming from, uh, from quite distant past, which are still dominating the global economic order, and many of them can evaporate and can be changed in, in coming decade or two. And so afterwards, I think the perspective for re recreating this economic order would be much more uh, realistic than they are now. Right. Now we are in a kind of a tunnel vision and we can <coughs> jump out of it. Thank you. So we should wait for a decade or so until things <laughs> become clear. And I guess my question to you, Jan, is can we afford to wait? No, I don't think we can afford to wait, but I want to clarify something about you know, the idea of setting priorities. That's all good, but unfortunately we can not lose track of the bigger picture and uh, we, we need a holistic view so that, you know, uh, the impact of our decision is clearly uh, assessed so that th there are no unattended consequences. And if you take the example of the carbon tax, that's going to have an impact on a single mom right. struggling to raise a child and <clears throat> who needs her car to visit patients because she's a nurse. The sad truth is that today, governments don't have the ability to target specific, very specific uh, categories of population. You can do it in broad terms, but if you look at how much money we wasted during COVID or during the inflation uh, period at, at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, it, it tells you a, a story that, that is a bit sad. So we really need to raise our game in terms of pricing uh, externalities. I think right. that that's essential. And you know, one area uh, in particular, if you look at the work, the, the latest report for, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, there's a lot of debate on whether uh, new projects uh, in all fossil energy should be allowed. And you know, you see a lot of arguments from here and there, uh, no consensus. And I think that's, again, a lack of fine-tuning or, or findings. And I think it's very important that NGOs in particular become more involved, uh, companies as well, to build uh, stronger data to uh, help governments uh, make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, of course, every politician that tries to price externalities uh, find that they run into immediate uh, political difficulties. And I guess the question for us is also going to be, to what extent are the political systems in our countries, in, in particularly in the rich countries, capable now of taking the decisions, both nationally and internationally, that everyone here is saying are essential? And, and I think, to what extent is the roots of the international economic disorder actually in national economic uh, dysfunctionality and national political dysfunctionality in so many countries. Okay, I think we have time for, we have 13 minutes. I want to take two questions and in the strictures from Madame Touré, I want to go to the, the people who are underrepresented on this panel, <laughs> which is young people. Uh, and women. One over there. And, 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 women. and also... Uh, <laughs> Not 
And please be precise and, and concise if you can. I will try. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Basil Kot. I work at the European Commission. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, you've mentioned that the global uh, economic uh, order is forever changing and is impacted by many factors. Uh, my argument is that, and you mentioned it as well, uh, it is impacted by the evolution of technology and innovations. My questions to you um, would be, in your opinion, do you think that the strategic use of innovations, new technology, in our era of, of global inter interconnect interconnectedness will lead to a more stable uh, economic order, or on the other hand, can lead to a disorder of the global economic system? Thank you. Very, very good question. So is the technological progress going to lead to more stability uh, or more instability? And, and you, would argue, you might also ask within countries, not just international. Anybody else have a question? No, I see no other questions. Okay, in that case, who would like to answer that question? Do you think that technology the pace of technological change, and, and particularly artificial intelligence now, is this going to make international economic relationships work better or, or more unstable? Anyone have a view on that? <clears throat> I've tried to ask a chat GPT, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> well, we could ask chat GPT for the answer, but... Uh, 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 I think it's a tough question, and it can go e e either way, really. Um, you know, as I said, you know, in principle, having more data, you know, more fine-tuning of, of models can help uh, educate all of us and, and hopefully come up with mutual decisions and, and that go in the right direction and, and that creates sort of win-win situations at the end. But, but, you know, technology can also create some new gaps uh, between countries. On balance, on balance, yeah. That, that was a very chat GPT answer, though, right? Because you're saying it can be this, can be that. What Mark said, are you feeling positive about this, or you think I'm more worried than I am feeling good about I'm, it? I am an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> but I'm sure. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I, di I think we do have the example of the Arab Spring, how much internet and um, technology play come into play. So the end of the process is another story. Uh, but if you come back to Africa, definitely um, it has uh, raised the level of consciousness, um, more participation of young people and, and women, and, and that's a good thing because I'm a, I mean, I'm a pro, I'm a pro disorder type of <laughs> activist. I mean, a, a disorder that would lead to a better order. So uh, for that sense, um, in that sense, I think it's a good thing that people get more aware of the, of, of the issues, of the scandal, um, that's one thing. Um, so it, it, it forces government even to be more accountable on the issue they deal with, and, and I think it, it, it's very good, because to get to a new order, you need some disorder, and maybe you know, technology is going to play a role. Of course, there is a downsize of it, we do know that, a message of hatred, um, and, and things like that, that we know, but globally, I think it, it, it's a good thing. It, it, it's a tool that gets citizens to participate more, especially in an environment where they don't have much access politically or economically. So it gave uh, more echo uh, to the voices of those who, you know, are leftovers, you know, on the side of the road. Thank you very much. Good. Bit of disorder. Uh, come in, please. Yes, I would like to address the question raised from the floor with regard to technology development. I think it's good or not. Uh, it can be good or bad, but I think they change the priorities. My experience in negotiating Korea US FTA, 2007-2006, at the time, with regard to telecommunication, most important issue was how to liberalize facility-based telecommunication services. But after that, with the uh, OTT service in place, facility-based telecommunication service is not so important. Value-added services are more important. No one talk about, no one talk about facility-based telecommunication services anymore, OTT. At the time, 
we did not know what is the OTT, and at the time, the OTT doesn't enter into force. So we resisted the U.S. request to liberalize tel the facility-based telecommunication services, but we fully liberalized value-added telecommunication services. And OTT, like Netflix, is come over to the world through facility-based telecommunication services. So the development of technology can change the priorities in international trade agenda, but it can be both good or bad. Right. Thank you. Pierre? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with what uh, has been said. I, I, I personally, as an engineer, see the potentialities in technology. I think there are a lot of promises in technological progress, but it is the responsibility of human beings to give a moral dimension to technology use. And so technology is not a substitute to political will and to thinking about the moral dimension, the ethical dimension of technological change. What makes me uh, more optimistic than I, I was earlier is that there are international discussions about that dimension, especially uh, as far insofar as uh, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, is concerned. So I, I, I think that uh, technology can bring people together to discuss substantial matters and that, that's a good news, even in the current context. Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess the progress of science generally is good, that, but its implication, its uncertainty. The movie recently released, uh, Oppenheim, uh, disclosed uh, these fundamental contradictions. I guess that's very simple. Uh, question, a simple answer. Thank you very much. But any thoughts on this? No, I, I just think that, of, uh, first of all, uh, technology brings chaos because uh, it uh, undermines uh, the, some old technologies, uh, some uh, established relations, uh, and some established visions. So therefore, it, every kind of technological breakthrough is connected with increasing chaos. But the, you know, I would say the mission of innovators is to do what they are doing to increase the chaos, and the mission of politicians and the mission of intellectual lead is just you know to combat this and to put in some framework, in some uh, uh, in, uh, to put some limits to this. So this is a kind of you know societal change it is, as it is organized. So I definitely oppose the idea that we should regulate and uh, limit uh, the creative knowledge and you know, the creative expression in any way. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I don't think that's a conversation that it is feasible to summarize. So what I will say, though, is that I think what's very clear from this is I don't think that this hankering for preserving the order in which we used to live is actually a meaningful approach because every time we start talking about it, we discuss mostly the so many problems that the order that we have has created. And I don't think we yet have agreement on what is the kind of order where we're going to where we would like to end up, let alone where we are going to end up. And I'd say there's some quite open questions about how long and how disorderly the transition process will be and whether during that transition process we can make progress on some of the common challenges where we can't afford to wait for the lack of clarity to be resolved because it will just end up creating disorder of a whole different magnitude. So I want to thank all our panelists for their insights. I want to thank you all for, for your presence and I'd like you to join me in, in giving them a round of thanks, please.